Yeah. Let's get going here. Um, this is the not well applies here as a reminder. Logistics again, please uh, add your name and affiliation. Uh, and um, um, if you wanna again queue management, if you wanna um, say something, please add yourself to the um, to the queue uh, by um, typing plus Q in the chat and minus Q if you wanna DQ. Quick update. Uh, the, the work group decided not to uh, adopt the OAuth, uh, OAuth POE tokens with HTTP messages at this stage. So that's um, that was um, based on the feedback that we got uh, on the lists. Uh, Hannes is working on the Shepard write-up for the RAR document. So I just changed the, the status of that document today. Yeah, I plan to have it. Um... And there are a few notes or a few comments I have um, to the authors of the document, but um, I will send it around tomorrow and we'll do an, um, the IPR confirmation as well also tomorrow. Uh, so you guys uh, can respond to that and, and yeah. Awesome, Thank, thanks, Hannes. Awesome. Good. And, and one other thing, uh, like um, if you guys have already some uh, links to the to implementations, uh, that that's always something that we want to add to the write-up uh, because it's very useful information for the ISG. So uh, look it up so we can attach it to the to the Shepherd write-up. Awesome. There were information about existing implementations in the in the slide deck we showed uh, during the presentation. So okay, okay cool. Then you, I copy it from there. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you need more information, just just yeah. reach out. No, that's a good start. Yeah, Thanks. but but I think Hannes still sent that email to the list to just just in case somebody else has implementation. So, uh, yep, we do. Okay, thanks, Hannes. Um, uh, RFC ninety sixty eight. Congratulations to Vittorio. So we we've done it. Yeah. yeah. There you go. I was waiting for that. <laughs> Okay, good. So today we, Mike, he's coming here. I, I can see you. Thanks for joining. Uh, a little bit late, but uh, okay, we'll forget you, forgive you this time. <laughs> Off the hook. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we'll talk about Depop today. Uh, next week, uh, we uh, Kelly will talk about um, a token exchange profile for enterprise. So looking forward to that too. That will uh, conclude our. Um, or um, interim meeting so far uh, for this this time. Uh, any questions? Any comments about this? Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing here. What is this? Stop sharing. And uh, Mike, up to you. Take All right, are you going to share my deck? Yes, you share your deck. Yes, I share my deck. Yes, okay. you. <laughs> I will do that then. You probably have the latest because I didn't keep up with. The... I haven't touched it since last night, but okay. Okay, I thought I thought you might have changed something after no, that. I have not. Um, okay, You're coming well, a bit up. soft, Mike. Uh, can you get what was closer? That? What, what are you saying, Rafat? Uh, I'm saying you're coming a bit soft. Uh, I can barely hear you. Do what I can do. Okay. Um, so, so we're going to talk about uh, Depop. And while I'm trying to get the deck in view, um, so let's talk about status for a minute. So we updated the draft a few weeks ago to add the uh, server nonces, both for the authorization server and for the resource server to use. And that mitigates known attacks where effectively you were only proving that you had a deep pop proof, not that it was current it uh um i don't think i'm seeing any slides is that uh intended no you're oh, not I, 
I'm, I'm trying to share them. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. I didn't try to think. You, US, um, and, and we can, you. can't hear you clearly. Like, uh, any any chance that you could do something else there? Um, Maybe I'm getting old. <laughs> no, no, I think it's, it's an old machine and it is what it is. Okay, so try to speak see, up maybe. Can you see slides now? It's coming. I don't see anything yet. Oh, here we go. Yep. Oh, okay. So we're trying to do a simple application level proof of possession for OAuth 2. You all know that. We added the server nonces and Brian also added some other actually editorial changes that were needed. And at that point, I actually thought we were close to done, but looking at the issues and talking to people, one more significant issue came up, which is applying proof of possession end to end, starting with the authorization request and not waiting until the token request to use the DPOP key. There's hey, no Mike, yes. you're really, really quiet. Why don't you go into settings and pump up your volume on your mic? I can find it. Be under audio and video, that's where it is in the Mac. That was uh, nasty dick. Okay. Uh, now, when I'm sharing my screen, I can't get to the settings. Do you wanna? Do you wanna allow maybe Brian? No. I know Brian's trying to get on the hook here, but I'm sorry for the audio visual problems. I hate virtual meetings, but I will do I will do what we can do. Okay. Um so after that there'd been discussion uh started by real attacks that were being executed against Azure Active Directory, where you actually need to bind the authorization code to the DPOP key or else uh, it's possible for the code to be exfiltrated, reused, and used at a place other than uh, the, where the client started. And remember that the client and the legitimate user of the client itself can be the attacker. So it's possible for a person in control of the machine to stop the client, get the code, steal it, and put it elsewhere. And traditional Pixie doesn't prevent that. And that's discussed in the issue. Um, there were actually two issues that both motivated this pull request. One was number 71 tie the keys back to the authorization endpoint so that you have end-to-end -end protection. Um, the other is by DW number, or no, that was by DW, others by an engineer here at Microsoft to describe and prevent the double code usage attack. So there's a PR that's been under discussion among the editors as well as Philippe and others to address this problem. Now, the open question is whether to do this using a Pixie verification method, as John Bradley suggested that we do, or to do it by adding a new parameter to just send the thumbprint 
directly and then you're not touching the pixie parameters and you could still use the s256 pixie in addition to this uh, both protecting the code in different ways at this point i'd like to open the floor for discussion of this. If, if, if you have any comments, please go and add yourself to the queue. Brian. Yeah, so two two things. I think um, there's also the, the possibility, as we've tried to discuss on the PR itself, of doing a, a sort of hybrid combined Pixie mode. Um, but Backing up, well, actually, I see Torsten's in the queue, so he'll he can maybe raise whether this is actually something that needs to be done or not. Um, that questions come up as well, but fundamentally, we we rely on Pixie right now in a lot of places, security BCP, and the uh, and even in two dot one to provide protections against code injection, um, and by taking that away and just replacing it with a, a pure depop key pixie method, we lose those protections because in many cases the depop key will not be um, unique to the transaction. So um, I want to make sure that we don't sort of take a step back in one area of security here while trying to tie things together in another with end to end. Uh, stuff and that could be accomplished either by treating the depop binding and the authorization request as a, a completely different thing, as mentioned here, or by building out a new Pixie method that includes more than just the the depop thumbprint. So there's a couple of different ways to attack it. Um, all right, I I yield my time. Thorsten. Hey everybody. Um... So, I mean, to, to partially also echo what Brian just said, um, if I get it right, the fundamental hypothesis of um, the proposal of this PR is that Pixie is broken. And I don't understand why. I mean, from a conversation on the PR, I have understood that the basic assumption is that um, it is an attack that is seen in the wild uh, that the uh, code along with the pixie verifier can be exfiltrated Correct. which i mean i'm not a, i'm not a security expert so i i would hope daniel could be in the call but he is he cannot unfortunately but this is a really strong um, assumption and it in the end from my perspective um is a serious a really serious um observation because if, if that is a serious problem yes then we need to revisit uh, the security pcp on o of 2.1 so i suggest we need a really thorough analysis of 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 this of this attack and a security analysis of the proposal on the table what i see on on, on first side is that and brian already pointed that out um, I'm, I'm not sure whether the, the security properties as Pixie has today in that it ensures the integrity of a certain transaction by using a transaction specific user agent bound secret by a depop key whose properties are not clear to me. So if that depop key is not bound to a certain device and it is not transaction specific, we have a security measure with completely different um, characteristics. Most notably, if the DPOP key is not bound to a device, the uh, what we lose is code injection protection. Because the reason why we introduced Pixie in OAuth 2.1 is to have a transaction-specific secret that is bound to a user agent, which allows the, the client to really determine that a code was issued on a different device. So. There are a lot of open questions from my perspective, which need to be carefully analyzed and discussed, and then we can decide as a working group how to proceed. 
Okay, thank, thanks, Thorsten. Uh, Mike, any any comment on that? Sure. Um, I, uh, you know, a few days ago when Brian made some of his comments on the PR, was largely convinced losing the protections of the S two fifty six hash and substituting it with something different, as John had suggested when we discussed it last week, might not be the right approach, that we could continue to use Pixie as it exists and have the uh, new Depop Jason Web Key Thumbprint quest parameters so that the Clients Depop key can be associated with the authorization code, preventing the attacks that we've seen, and those are discussed in the PR. There's by Will Bartlett, who's one of the players at Microsoft that's seen the attacks. Um, and I'm perfectly willing to transform the current PR, which introduces the Pixie method into one that just adds the new parameter. Now, Torsten makes good comments about stuff being transaction specific. And indeed, Pixie is supposed to be used in a way that you're using a different verifier with each transaction. It is the case by design that DPOP keys may be used multiple times by the client. So if we were to leave the Pixie method in place, we would either have to mandate rotation of the keys with each use, um, to maintain the same Pixie semantics, or we can just leave Pixie alone and parameter. And I would be curious if people would like me to transform this into just adding a new parameter. Okay. Um, Hannes. Uh, is there a question to Mike uh, about the attack and and Thorsten said it, this attack has some some certain assumptions. Um, I don't understand what the assumptions are like. Is there some detail on the attack um, available so that we better understand whether the threat model has changed compared to what we assumed um, to exist in with Pixie? Sure. Because, um, it's both written down in the PR, but I will describe it verbally, one of the ways that this attack occurs is when the attacker is a legitimate user of a legitimate client, a human being. So, for instance, this is seen for real at banks, where banks are using lockdown machines with auditing controls in place. And Yet the bank employee being a bad actor will start the transaction and then halt it in the middle, copy the authorization code and the Pixie verification information to a different machine not owned by the bank without the audit controls in place and then proceed to use the code effectively as a bearer token, which you can do, given you have the Pixie verifier information, which again, it's a legitimate client. The transaction was started legitimately, the human being interrupted and exfiltrated the code. Okay. Thank Brian. You. Hey, Mike, 
Um, I'm trying to take notes. Can you just repeat the attack of what the bad employee does? I didn't quite get that. The bad employee on the bank computer makes the authorization request, um, but when the authorization code is returned, he interrupts the flow and does not make the token request. Instead, he copies the authorization code and the Pixie verification information to a different machine and makes the authorization or it makes the token request there. It's therefore, bypassing the bank's audit controls uh, that would otherwise be in place if the OAuth token request occurred on the legitimate computer. Instead, it's made on a different computer controlled by the attacker. Who is a human being? Yeah, thanks. I, I think he, he got it this time, Dick, right? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Mike. Th thanks, Dick. Appreciate that. Uh, Brian. I queued myself out something specific to say, clarify and respond to Torsten, but I can't remember what it is now. I'm sorry. I was <laughs> listening to Mike, but I think I, maybe specifically is we we can introduce something like this without getting rid of the the normal standard s 2 v 6 pixie protection so it's i agree there's probably some more thinking analysis that should be done but it doesn't i, I think moving forward it, it sounds like there's a, a a lot of um momentum in that regard anyway so maybe rather than pushing back on it entirely at this point, we should just make sure we don't undo anything when we move forward. And again, that that can be accomplished either with a new Pixie method that includes both the DPOP key and some kind of transactional challenge similar to what we have now, or by introducing this, this other parameter. Um, but so there's a couple of different ways to tackle it going forward, but we just wanna make sure we don't do what's in the pull request currently, which sort of undoes some of the, the current protections and replaces it with something that provides different protections. We can do both, um, and there's a couple of different ways to do it. So maybe that's the, the best way to move forward. Yeah, and I agree with your commentary and appreciate your analysis of the situation. I mean, John and DW and I were sort of flying by the seat of our pants last week when we realized that this was a significant and real attack. And we all said, well, it sounds like we're protecting the authorization code. Pixie is for that. Let's do that. But I agree that the thing in the PR doesn't retain everything that this 256 does. So maybe I'll take the action item to just create a different PR with the parameter, leave the current one in place and we'll decide which one to change. Okay. Um, Aaron. Uh, I guess people are mostly on board. I just wanted to echo Torsen's comment though about the making sure that we still get the per transaction property of Pixie. Um, however, in think in, in talking through all this, I'm realizing that the proposal of including the DPOP public key fingerprint does not actually solve any of this because assuming the model you're talking about where the attacker can interrupt before an HTTP connection is established, they could just swap out the request with their own public key fingerprint just as well as they could swap out the response. So that doesn't actually solve it if you're still using the uh, you know, initiating the flow with a get request. No, I understand what you're saying, but this also is related to code reuse, which, yes, is not supposed to be possible, but as John and I were talking about, uh, Pixie is kind of predicated on the code not reusable, being reusable, which isn't the case in practice on a number of deployments. No, no, I'm, that sounds like something different. I'm talking about 
if you if you do redo the PR to to keep the Pixie parameters in place, but then separately introduce a new property for the Depop public key, it still doesn't actually solve the attack because the attacker could swap out the public key that's made in the request. So the authorization server sees the attacker's fingerprint first and then issues the authorization code bound to the attacker's fingerprint. No, I understand what you're saying, but it does prevent a different attack, which is assuming the code can be reused, then it does prevent the attacker from reusing it with a different DPOP key of the attacker's choosing. It sounds like um, what's what we actually need here is a clear description of all of the different new threats that are being discussed here, because this is not something that is typically, um, uh, you know, not part of the original threat models that like the security BCP is based on. So if there's new kinds of attacks being talked about, I think those need to be written down first I... before we start throwing in solutions. Okay, yeah. well. We took an attempt at writing those down in the PR, and then they're described in uh, comments, particularly the ones by uh, Will Barr in the PR. Now, it's entirely possible that those descriptions are inadequate, and we can work on that. And I agree, we want to be super clear. The bank attack where the employee is the attacker is the primary scenario that's making Microsoft believe that proof of possession is essential. We have real customers where this is happening. Yeah, and that's the one I'm talking about where it isn't actually solved by this proposal. Because if, if the assumption is the user is the attacker and can interrupt HTTP requests, before they're made, then they can swap out any of the values made in any of the requests. Yeah, I understand that. Okay, so yeah, let's then capture this in the in the document, and then we can can discuss it. Uh, anything else, Aaron? Is that? No, that's all. Yeah, thanks. Torsten. Yeah, in the end, um, as it turns out, I'm just echoing what Aaron just said. I mean, in the in the long history of the OAuth working group, we should have learned that um, a detailed and clear description of, an, of, of attacks documented so that everyone in the, in the working group can read it, understand it, and argue about it is a prerequisite for designing appropriate countermeasures. That's why we had the um, the over security threat model initially. That's why we have the security BCP. And uh, I'm really I'm really happy and appreciate that Microsoft shares um, the experience from from the from the on the wide with us. But Mike, we really need to understand what the attacks are um, in order to understand what we need to do. And looking on the PR and uh, and and the emails that we exchanged. Um, there are the details missing that you, for example, just explained in the meeting uh, that are very helpful to understand the, the whole scenario. So my proposal is really to either sketch or to describe those scenarios, the threats in, in a separate document, because they seem to be very serious and not only affecting Depop. And then let's work from them, from there. I mean, it could also be a new security PCP of some kind, but that's that's really needed. And some thoughts on on the proposal to um, to keep Pixie and introduce a new depot parameter in the authorization request. Uh, I think we could do that. My feeling is then we kind of introduce a new way of authenticating public clients with the token endpoint, because the same could be achieved by just dynamically registering the client with the AS and then just use the the authentication credential to to authenticate the client when it 
tries to to redeem the code. Uh, we could do that, um, but as I said, I, I need to understand what's what's really all about. And the second thought is, as far as I understood, stood wet. He wants to get rid of the of the one time use um, requirement for codes. And I mean, there's another ongoing discussion about that. Uh, that was, I think, um, caused by our proposal to 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 remove some of the requirements in the course of the OAuth two point one specification. I think we need to be really clear what we're talking about. If one of the reasons to really pursue that proposal is to get rid of one time use for code and verifiers. Then it should be made very clear and discussed in the working group. Yeah, and and way, I'm supporting. That... I'm supporting. I'm supporting that objective because I know how 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 difficult it is to really implement one-time use, but that that cannot be kept under the cover. That needs to be discussed transparently. Right, and that is and has been discussed on the mailing list. I mean, I didn't speak up during the OAuth two point one interim about that because I wanted to think about it. But as I've said on the list, as others have said, I think that's a terrible mistake to remove the one time use requirement. As John has said, uh, the security of Pixie rests on the one time use. I, 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 I agree. I agree, Mike. But but what your colleague explicitly called out that he wants to get rid of the one time use. In the comment at DPR. But colleague? Well, Will is, has taken some discussions in different directions than maybe are um, uh, productive for moving things forward, would be my interpretation of it. And that could be, he's, he's an engineer who writes code and he's very good, but he's not usually engaged in standards discussions. Um, Speaking of colleagues, um, I know that my colleague, uh, Peter Castleman, has had his hand up for a while and wanted to talk about another attack that motivates this parameter. Do you want to talk for a moment, Peter? Sure. So, uh, sorry. So, so hold, hold on. Hold on. Uh, like, Peter, okay. please add yourself to the queue because there are other people in the queue here. Oh, thank you. How do I add myself to the queue? Because I, I just put my hand up. I thought that was how I get into the queue. Is there a different way to do this? No, yeah, we just go to the chat and plus Q, please. That's uh, the way we do it here. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Hannes, go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> I want to echo a little bit what uh, Thorsten said. Um, and this this has been indeed a, a, um, a common problem in the in the discussion in the group is we, as engineers, um, we like to talk about solutions, um, but writing down clearly what the threats are, what the assumptions are, is not necessarily our strong side. And uh, um, funny enough, um, shortly after Thorsten said that, he immediately spoke about solutions as well. Um, and and I, I think it would really help everyone if we had a clear description um, in what form um, does matter on sort of the new assumptions and the threats, I think that would be really cool. Maybe if someone could put that together, Mike or so. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, I mean, I can... we would spend, uh, we would make so much progress. Yeah, and I will work with others to do that very thing. I completely agree. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dick, do you wanna talk about the, your comment there? Well, I'm just kind of echoing what other people have said. Let's make sure we understand what the problem is. Um, okay. Is this a spa app? It might be, it might be a web app. Well, the, the security properties are very different between whether it's a spa or web app. Like, I, it's not clear to me if it's a web app and the server has the pixie material, how the attacker can get the pixie material because the attacker controls the client uh sure but if <laughs> okay 
yeah, yeah, I guess yeah. these details needs to be added to the document just to make sure, right? It's clear. So I agree. Thank, thanks, Dick. Um, Peter. Excellent. Um, so I think one of uh, for two questions actually. So I hope that's okay. Um, or two co a comment and a question. So the, the first one, just a comment. Uh, or, or in addition to the attack, so one of the, and I would believe Will also described this in, in his comments on the PR, one way in which this attack is also manifesting itself is um, uh, when attackers gain access to log files. And so I think we've had some evidence of that happening as well. And, um, you know, that, those log files, sometimes they, you know, they can be in, in many places and they get exported um, and stored and applications uh, keep caches and so on. So there are these other sort of points where the authorization code and the pixie proof um, can actually be exposed um, and, uh, in addition to the, the scenarios that Mike has, has described. So, so I think there's some documentation to that effect, but it, it sounds like we, we, we uh, it sounds like there's some some work to just document uh, some of that more fully for folks. The the other question that I had for Brian was uh, if you could maybe just uh, explain a little bit more about the transactional guarantees that um, he's worried about losing uh, by the um, by introducing this binding with a DPOP key versus using Pixie. I, I'm just curious to understand the concerns there. Brian, do you want to answer that? I can try. So the it, it's the same stuff that that now the BCP and OAuth two dot one have introduced the use of the SHA two fifty six Pixie method in order to prevent what is effectively replay of a stolen authorization code back through the legitimate client, particularly like a client that is itself a web app. Uh, a code can be played by an attacker through a browser, injecting it into the authorization response such that the client, um, you know, sees it as normal and, and plays it against back against the authorization server. When you have a transaction specific Pixie piece, the, this will be this will prevent that kind of attack because the authorization code which was issued is issued against it or bound to a particular transaction specific pixie piece whereas if you don't have that piece if, you, if you're just doing the pixie i'm sorry that's too many terms if you're just doing the depop key bound into it and the confidential client the web server client is using the same depop key for multiple uh, access tokens, transactions, which I think is very likely in in many types of deployments, that code a code can be replayed back through the authorization response um, and and won't be detected. It'll still be issued. Uh, I'm not sure quite how to explain it more than that. I know it's a little bit rambly, but this is sort of long-standing, well, reasonably long-standing precedent in the way that. Pixie has been employed in more recent work in in the in the working group to to prevent a, a somewhat different class of attack, but but something we we've, we've come to account on. So by taking away like the transaction specific random bits that you have in Pixie now and replacing them with a more likely static representation of the key that that's more like a client held credential, you you lose some of that protection against um, in, injection. Okay, now that, that's helpful, uh, and I'm curious uh, because you'll be verifying the DPOP proof as well. And that proof is a signature with some random bits in it as well. Uh, I was just curious if you. It might be interesting to see if the uh, the transactional nature can be transferred from uh, the code changing all the time to the thing that you're signing changing all the time. But that we, we if you include. If you would include a nonce, then that, that you would have that transaction specific secret, then we are back to the pixie verifier. Right. Well, it's some kind of nonce, but but it needs to come through the initial authorization request for it to be bound. Um, it, it's sort of too late to get those specifics when you're when you're doing the token request at the token endpoint. So the equity, I just posted um, a 
a link in the in the uh, in the chat window, which describes um, the the um, the attack at length, and also discusses different options to to cope with it. So if you want to take a look on that, Peter, um, that that might be helpful as well. I think that's the same links that's in the discussion a couple of times in the PR as well. Okay, I'll okay. summarize that the action item is to get the threat written down clearly. People agree with that? If so, there's uh, two more slides to go through about next steps and open issues. I don't know if we want to continue this discussion or. Yeah, so, okay. So, hey, Mike. <laughs> Sorry, yes? you were quiet again and I didn't actually hear what your summary was. I believe the summary is the, the primary action item is to write down the threat well enough that it's commonly understood or the threats. Okay, good. Anything else? Aaron, you, you had a comment there, but I think uh, the goal is to document this anyway. So hopefully it will be clear at that time. Uh, any any comments uh, from you, Aaron? No, that sounds like a great next step. Okay. 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 Right. Um, okay. Next, um, keep going, Mike. Okay, so the next steps as I saw them a few days ago when I wrote these slides uh, were to decide how to achieve the end to end binding that we've been discussing during most of the call. And we've added the action item to write the threat down even more clearly. Um, finally, to try to finish this, we need to consider all the remaining open issues and decide what actions are appropriate to take for each of them. Some of them are asking for clarifications of existing things. Some of them may be asking for uh, normative spec text. So I'll go to the open issues. There's currently eight open issues at least as of last night, there were eight open issues. There may be more now. Um, that we as a working group need to triage. Um, Brian helpfully pointed out that there were a couple PR comments by Philippe that really requested clarifications about the silver nonce and the properties of it, which probably uh, merit discussion in the draft. So those are another thing to do. And Neil Madden made some uh, several comments in the mailing list. So merit consideration. Neil, are you on the call? I don't think he is. Um, I see Philip in the queue. Philip. Yeah, I'd like to help the group out. I don't think we have enough time to discuss my particular issues and seeing how draft 04 was already published with the nonce in place. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I would create new issues with my concerns or my questions um, explicitly spelled out so that we can open, uh, we can continue the discussion in a, in a fresh thread. Is that okay? I would love it if you filed an issue or two, Philippe. Thank you. All right. Good enough. And I was going to ask the same of Neil. Neil actually, I think, probably has three issues worth of comments. So after the call, I'll just send email to Neil CCing the group asking him to file issues. Okay. Thanks, Philip. Uh, Brian. I was just going to comment before that, that I think the heart of Neil's questions, comments are very similar to what Philip was saying. So, but yeah, I guess we'll get stuff in the issue tracker and move from there. Okay. 
All right. Um, by my clock, we have seven minutes. Do we want to at least open the set of issues and look at them as a group, or do we want to just send that off to the editors to do? Why don't we look at the list? Um, I'm going to stop sharing because I'm sharing the PowerPoint screen. Um, if I can figure out how to do that, I have changed the WebEx interface significantly. Um, at the bottom, there, there is a share. If you click that again, I found something at the top. Where do we actually have the slides? I need to include them to the meeting minutes. I emailed them to the chairs and to uh, editors. Yes, that's fine. I, I, I thought you, you updated those, but uh, you still, okay, that's fine. No, I'm using the ones that I emailed. Okay. Um, all right. Can try to share the issues list. We can at least look at it. Okay. Yeah, five minutes. Uh, just, just to be clear, five minutes here, right? Yeah, I know. I just want people to get their eyes on it. I don't expect okay. to actually be able to triage at this point. If I can get the share button to do anything. It's coming. Okay. That should be the current set of issues, which is still eight. Um, Again, DW filed an issue way back in April about token exfiltration, which is part of the discussion we were just having. Uh, 39 ref referral binding. Do any of the editors on the call have familiarity with that one? Yeah, Mike Egan put it in, you know, years ago, and it's I don't know. I don't even know how to respond to it. It's very different than anything that the spec's actually doing. Um, and we're not, we're, we've taken, we should just close it. But at some point, I, I don't know how we. Okay, I'll take that offline with the editors. Oh, you're right. This is 2019. Um, well, Link, do you want to talk about SPA recommendations? 50? I don't think at the moment, no. Um, it's, I, I don't even remember what, what it was about. Again, 2019, yeah. That, yeah. That's fine. Okay, I think, Mike, let's maybe wrap up this this okay. uh, this call. I think, uh, yeah, I, I don't think we can get anything done with, with this at this stage. Um, that's fine. Okay, Mike, th thank you very much for, for this uh, and, and team. Um, uh, Dick and uh, and Hannes, thank you for taking notes. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, we will meet next week. I haven't expected so many discussions, so it was a good session. Yeah, it was a good session, yeah. session for sure. I, I did my best to sort of record something in the meeting minutes with the help from Dick, but uh, you guys can have a quick look um, to fill in the gaps. That would be useful. Okay. Okay. I appreciate everybody's thoughtful discussions today. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.